I'm well, howdy. Hi. All right, that's, that's the A&M introduction. I'm, I'm uh, Andy Morris, I'm the dean, and I'm very happy uh, today to be able to introduce uh, Professor Gabriel Eckstein to start things off for today's program. This is exactly the kind of program that this university is known for. We are a Tier 1 AAU public land-grant university, and if we unpack that, uh, Tier 1 and AAU mean that we strive to be the best at research and teaching, while public land-grant means that we strive to do things that have an impact on our community, the state, the nation, and the world. And this is just the kind of program that does that. And we have, uh, have this program due to the seemingly tireless efforts of Professor Eckstein. He's not only a terrific teacher, as his students here will attest, but he's also a prolific scholar working on cutting edge issues in water and energy, the intersection of which is vital to the future welfare of our state. In addition, he's taken on the role of organizing events like this one that add value to Texas by addressing issues critical to our future. Beyond today, he's working on a number of interdisciplinary programs, bringing together his geology degree and his legal education and his teaching and research. He's also one of our many faculty making use of our affiliation with Texas A&M to expand the opportunities for our students. So for example, he's working on a collaborative project with the water program at A&M, uh, which will bring uh, students to, for two weeks uh, to the uh, A&M Study Center in Guanajuato, Mexico, where they'll look at water, food, and energy nexus in the U.S. and Mexico. So as a result of his leadership uh, in this area and collaboration with colleagues here and in College Station, our students are exceptionally trained. So this is the commercial. So any lawyers here who need a student, uh, well trained, probably among the best trained in the state of Texas in water and energy, that's the man to go see after the program. Indeed, his former students have found their way into some of the state's top water and environmental law firms, into state and federal regulatory agencies, like the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and the EPA. Most recently, he placed students in, a wa in water law related internships with Houston, law firms in Austin, and the Trinity River Authority. So anybody looking for a student, please see Professor Eckstein. So let me turn it over to him to introduce our speaker and launch the program. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for uh, participating in our now, we can actually say annual, water lecture series. This is the second one that uh, we've organized. The first one last year brought in Michael Young, uh, uh, from Australia, and if you are interested in, in uh, uh, viewing that particular lecture, it is on YouTube. We have it linked on our, from uh, the law school's website. He was speaking uh, about his experience in Australia and the tremendous drought that has hit uh, that, uh, that country and their response, the, the water marketing scheme that uh, um, they've implemented and has had considerable success and there's been quite a bit of interest in Texas in pursuing uh, that type of approach uh, here in light of our uh, ongoing drought. Uh, but there's a lot more we can say about water, and water touches every aspect of society. Uh, energy is one of the areas where it is probably most critical because you cannot have energy production without water. And conversely, you cannot have water without energy. Uh, the two go hand in hand, and that is something we're actually uh, really focused on here at the law school in developing activities, programs, uh, courses uh, that are focused on this reality, that the, the two have to go hand in hand. And uh, with that, I have to uh, um, uh, introduce you to one of my colleagues who's uh, very instrumental in developing the, this, this approach, this focus, uh, and that's Professor Gina Warren uh, sitting right there in the middle. Uh, Together with her, we're actually organizing these kinds of events. Uh, we're bringing speakers who are knowledgeable about these areas, and we're looking to do more. So any of you who are in the industry, who are working out there already, uh, in addition to hiring our students, uh, I want you to please come up to us and let us know where are the gaps in terms of uh, policies, in terms of laws, in terms of what's actually happening out there in the world. What can we as a law school help and what can we do in terms of um, educating our students, engaging the community, becoming part of uh, the broader society in terms of addressing water and energy issues, not just in the state but uh, globally. On the issue of global water and energy issues, this is particularly of interest now 
uh, to us here in Texas and in the United States what is happening in Mexico. Uh, Mexico has embarked on a really fascinating, uh, I, I would say, experiment of denationalization, uh, the, uh, denationalizing the energy sector. It's the first country to have done that that has previously first nationalized their energy uh, industry. Uh, nobody's ever denationalized it. Nobody has ever tried. In many parts of the world, many countries around the world, Latin America and Asia, they're looking out in Mexico to see uh, what will be the outcome of, of this, ex this great experiment. Uh, they are now in the, their first rounds of uh, bidding, of uh, uh, inviting bids from companies from around the world um, uh, to participate in the development of their energy sector. And this is a really something that uh, we're looking at very closely, very interested in. in. As I said earlier, you can't have energy without water. And that's, water will be and is a huge component of that uh, development. And so today we have a, uh, we're really delighted to have uh, Dr. Montemayor uh, come and talk to us about some of these issues that are facing the Mexican energy sector in terms of developing that energy uh, uh, sector and the water components, uh, water uh, aspects of, uh, of that challenge. Now, uh, Dr. Montemayor is an economist by training, uh, received his PhD from uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, and he worked, uh, and I can't remember the name of the gentleman he worked with, but uh, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Lawrence, Tribe. Lawrence Tribe. I'm sorry? Klein. Klein. I'm sorry, Klein, Lawrence Klein, uh, Nobel Prize winner uh, in economics. And so this is, th this is someone who brings in a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge uh, to this particular topic. Uh, also of, of, of great interest is that not only is he an academic and, and an economist, but he's also been a politician. Uh, very long history in Mexican politics, uh, has had uh, numerous high positions, including governor of the state of Coahuila. Uh, currently, he's director uh, or, or president of the cluster, the energy cluster in the state of Coahuila, uh, which I think builds also not only on his governorship, but also as uh, past uh, uh, president of Pemex, which is the national uh, state-owned uh, oil uh, industry in uh, the country of Mexico. So we're delighted to have Dr. Montemayor here. Uh, inform us about what is going on in Mexico, also inform us about what is our interest in their development, because I think this is something that we're very interested in seeing, what is happening just south of our border, and how will that affect what happens here in Texas and the United States. We have a long-standing relationship with our, our neighbor to the south, and so this is of great importance to all of us. So, Dr. Montemayor, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for being here, and thank you for inviting me to, to come here and, and talk about this uh, Mexican energy reform. Uh, what I want to do is um, I want to uh, touch several things. I want to first, I want to go through the main uh, characteristics of the reform. Then. Uh, this reform, as you may imagine, has opened lots of opportunities, but also posed lots of uh, challenges to Mexico. So to cope with those challenges in Coahuila, we, de we de develop a cluster, and I would speak briefly about that. And then we'll go to s look into some uh, of the challenges, some that have to do with sustainability. The, those are the, the challenges related to land rights, uh, community relations and social alliance, water and environment. I will only refer to the ones that are on, are on the line. And some of the challenges have to do with the efficiency of the operations of the oil and gas uh, industry. I will refer only to human resources. If you want to ask uh, later, you know, the session about any of the others, I will gladly talk about them. So the reform. is very the oil in Mexico is a very touchy issue. You know, Mexico nationalized its oil in 1938. And since then, 
Well, that was a very traumatic experience. You know, the companies at that time uh, was suspected that they retired from Mexico, but also blocked Mexico from exporting to anywhere. And Mexico, and they took all the technicians, and they took everything. So it was a very hard effort, um, a, a big challenge for Mexico to cope with that and put the industry back up again. And but somehow we did. And in the last 20 years, there have been a lot of intents to reform this sector, which met with lots of uh, opposition from different parts of the political spectrum. But finally, in, in 2013, we were able to come to a, an agreement you know, among the major for the political forces, just enough to get the Constitution amended. So in July the, last year, the initiative was presented to Congress in 2013. Then was a period of debate. And finally, December of 13, the, the, the Congress approved a constitutional reform to reform three articles of the Constitution, 25, 27, 28, which refer to oil, the property of oil and all who can uh, participate in the industry and so forth. And also, since there is, like usually is the case, a lot of uh, mistrust among political parties, they had to, to put into the Constitution, to the Reform 21 transitional provision that will set the framework for the secondary laws that will had to be discussed after the constitutional amendment were approved by the whole state congresses. So th that place took, uh, that part took place in uh, 2014. In April, the initiative was, uh, once the constitution was already in place, you know, first Congress has to approve it by certain percentage of votes and it has to go to the, all the 31 state Congress and uh, has to be approved at least uh, half plus one. So once that was done, then the initiative to, re to reform 2012 laws and to create nine new laws was presented, which this initiative will develop the 21 provisional tra pr transitory provisions uh, that were in the constitutional reform. So there was also a, a very heated debate. And finally, in August last year, Congress approved the reform and the reform is now working its way. The the reform has a lot of uh, issues or a, a lot of uh, main characteristics. The, the first one is that the property of oil, uh, we call it underground oil, once it's below the surface, remains the same. It's a national property. That's not private property. But, one, but now the, the, the new thing is that private uh, investors can participate in bringing that, uh, that oil up to the surface and selling it, transforming it, and doing whatever has to be done. So for that to happen, there was uh, a new institutional design created. The state has several, uh, a very important part in the process, the energy department is the one responsible for a law of uh, energy policies. Uh, the Treasury Department, is SACP, is uh, re uh, the department responsible for setting the fiscal and economic guidelines for, for the participation of private investors. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Department of uh, Economics is uh, responsible for promoting the national content in the projects. And there is also the SEMARNAT, which is the, the environmental department, which is responsible for protecting the, the environment. <coughs> the regulatory bodies were uh, strengthened and a new one was created. The CNH, which is the National Hydrocarbons Commission, is responsible to, they got all the information that was in payments was transferred to this commission and they're responsible to keep that and to uh, any new information that will be coming from all the activities that will be taking place will have to be sent to the, uh, to this, uh, uh, to this commission. 
He's responsible, this commission is responsible to carry out the, the bidding and the contracting. And this is a very important thing that, uh, that happened because according to Mexican law, there was a discussion where to set, where to set that uh, or to leave that uh, responsibility. It could be in one of the departments of the executive or it could be a, in a different body like uh, the CNH. And finally, what decided that, uh, what decided that it uh, was given that authority to the, this uh, regulatory body. And the reason is very, very clear. In Mexican law, the president has no limitations to appoint and remove his secretaries, uh, uh, heads of the departments. And in contrast, the National Hydrocarbons Commission has First, there are requirements that people who is going to be appointed to that position have to, met, to meet. You know, you have to have experience, a certain background, etc. For the secretaries, there is no restriction. You can make your horse counsel like, you know, the Roman emperors used to do. And has happened sometimes in Mexico. And so, and it doesn't have to go, it doesn't have any screening, any discussion, you know, just the president, he decides that. So it was a good thing that first you have requirements you have to meet, and then you have a screening process because the president proposes and, co and the Senate approves. So I think that gives you, and also they have a set period of time that goes beyond the presidential term which eventually, you know, you will have uh, members of those commissions that will be appointed by different presidents or different parties over time. And I think they will give uh, stability and uh, autonomy to, to this body and which also confidence to investors. The CRR, CRE is the uh, Regulatory Energy Commission and they are, um, in charge of permits for the mid and downstream permits. The, the first bidding will be for EMP activities and for all the rest of the oil activities and electri electrical uh, projects, it will be for the CRE. And that, that will take the form of permits. You don't have uh, bidders there. And the uh, ACEEA is the Security and Energy and Environmental Agency. This is a new one. The first two already existed, but they were given more attributions, more uh, autonomy, and uh, also more budget too. And one of, the, uh, one of the good things about the reform is this Mexican Petroleum Fund. Prior to that, you know, Pemex, well, I, I don't know if you are aware, but Pemex was paying uh, every single expense in Mexico, public expense, school, roads, hospital, what have you, about from 35 cents to 40 cents will come from Pemex. Pemex was paying 60 to 65% of its gross income as taxes. Some years Pemex had to borrow to pay taxes even though Pemex has had a, a very large uh, operating uh, margin, like around 60%, which is one of the largest among com uh, petroleum oil companies. So now we have the Mexican Petroleum Fund, and that's an independent fund. You have independent uh, members, the Bank of Mexico also, the Central Bank. and. Uh, 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 the Treasury Department no longer can uh, take, uh, you know, put their hands on that money and cover any shortage of funds uh, from collecting taxes. So they have to do the job of collecting taxes now. And PMS was transformed. PMS will no longer be a part of the structure of, of government. It will be, it has been transformed already. The process is already in, in going on to make it a, what they call a productive state uh, enterprise, which has a board of directors, has autonomy, and it's a, it'll be like any other firm, just the difference will be that it's owned by the state.
but not managed by the state. That's the, the, the main difference. So this is the, the new, there are three types of contracts production sharing, profit sharing, and licenses. And this is are the, the fiscal responsibilities. They have corporate income tax, like any other company, a surface rent, state and local taxes, basic royalty, uh, a signature bonus, which applies only in the case of the license, and the payment to the state. In the, in the first, in production is in kind, and the other two is in cash. And there is uh, the mechanism cost recovery, which is allowed in production and profit, but not uh, in license. You have no restriction. And there is an adjustment mechanism. And here are the, some of the figures. The corporate income tax is 30% in Mexico. There are the surface rents in the rent. In the first 60 months of the contract, you will pay uh, 1,100 Mexican pesos per square kilometer. And after that, you will pay to 2,700 pesos for the same. And then you have a sta state and local taxes for this activity, which with those for exploration is 1,500, and for production will be 1,600. And oh wait, and this is the exam This example is taken from from, from the first uh, bidding that is going now. This is for uh, w uh, what they call shallow waters. It started in December last year, the, the bidding process. And oh wait. The basic royalties for crude oil, if the price is below $48, 75%, if it's above, it's, it's a little more with a formula to escalate, depending on the price. And natural gas, if the price of gas is le less than $5, uh, dollars. you pay no royalty. But if it's above also, you have to pay something you know, according to that, to that formula. And fund for condensate, it's the same. And uh, the, the amount of cost that, 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 wait, that you can recover is 60% of total income per period. The cost that you don't recover that year, you can carry it forward to the next year. And there is, this, is, this, this adjustment mechanism is something that is uh, a kind of an issue because it's constructed in such a way that uh, it creates pervert uh, incentives, you know, because let's say that the, the, the metric for operating income is 20%. That would be a kind of a tier, a TRI, a TRI uh, internal, uh, well, t internal rate of return. IRR. Uh, if you say this is going to be 20%, you pay certain the amount that you, and then you offer to the government you, uh, X, which is the chair. Let's say you say to the government, I'll give you 20% of my, of my profits or production, whatever. But when it goes from 20 to 35%, the formula means that, it, let's say you, in your bid, you said you, you were going to give the government, the government 20%, and that you were going to have an internal rate of return of 20%. But if the prices rise, or you get a better field than you expected, or for some reason your tier goes from 20 to 35%, the, the amount that government will end up having will go to 80%, and yours will go to 20%. So this is something that is still in, in discussion because it's, uh, it creates a, uh, the, the incentive to, to cheat. Because what you will do or to hold back your horses, you know, if you see that you're getting very close to 20%, then you lower the rate of, uh, of growth of your project. You, you start drilling less or devising some kind of cheating mechanism to, to not let your IRR go above 20%. So I, I think it's going to, and there is also an awarding variable and local content has to be 25% and it has to increase 
1% per year to reach 35% in 2025. So the bidding process, first start with the design of the contract. You know that the, the Energy Department and the National Hydrocarbon Commission, they are responsible for selecting the areas that will be offered. Uh, the Treasury, Hacienda, will establish the fiscal conditions for that uh, bid. And the energy will set the technical guidelines. Then the bidding process is conducted. As, as we mentioned, the main guidelines will be set by energy department. But the responsible for the process and for the bidding will be the National Hydrocarbons Commission. And the privates or payments could whoever wins. Pemex will not be allowed to participate in all, in, 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 in most of the, of the buildings. He has already gi been given a part of the M Mexican reserves, and I'll, I'll show you that. Then the operation, while the project is operating, the, the Hydrocarbons Commission will be the responsible for the plan, for, supervi for approving your plans, for supervising exploration and drilling activities, and for the technical management of, of the contract. And the Environmental and Security Agency will be responsible for security regulation and environmental overseas. And then the income will payment, the fund, the petroleum fund will pay to the contractors, to each one, to, to every part of that contract, to the private investor and to the other, whatever corresponds to each one, and manage the state part of it. Because there are rules in what you can do with that money, the state. The, the private part, well, the private will decide what to do with it. But the, the state part, there are rules what you can invest, how much you can use to finance the public expenditures. You have limits, and you have to create uh, uh, funds to, to finance education and other things like that. The, the idea in the line behind this is that you have to create an alternative asset, renewable one, that will compensate for the destruction of the oil asset that you are the extracting from the ground. So this is, this is the size of the market, you see? Uh, Pemex was given 83% of uh, proven reserves and 25% of uh, prospective resources. <coughs> and the rest, 67, 68% is uh, uh, available for private investor. The reason for this is that it will take several years for private producers to get oil into the market. So Mexico c could not take the chance to let Pemex down. And so they gave uh, Pemex enough reserves to maintain a certain, uh, the, the actual production level. And the increase will come from private sources. So, so that's the rationality for, 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 this, for this decision. So it was called round zero, because uh, the bidding will come in rounds. And this is the. The, the, the lots that are at for a private investor in what is called round one. Some of them are for extraction, for exploration. Uh, there's also what they call Pemex farm out. Assets, oil assets that belong to Pemex, but Pemex doesn't want or doesn't have the money or doesn't want to develop it. And he's offering to the private to, for them to develop in in a, some kind of agreement between the private and Pemex. And there are also these ones which were Pemex current contracts. Pemex was already given out to what they call service contract to private uh, investors. And there are some already working. And the idea is that they have to migrate from the old uh, contractual form to the new ones provided by the law. So that's a, that's a huge part of it. And this is how, how the, 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 the status of, of it. The first one was shallow water exploration. It started in December, and we expect around July 
that the contracts will be awarded to. There were 39 uh, major companies that are participating in this process. So there was a lot of interest. And you are, they put uh, f 14 blocks. It says 49. Actually, there were more interest companies, but at the end, after the quali pre qualifying process, only 39 remained. And, and the, from there, those, some of those 39 will win the 14 blocks that uh, are in that bid. Then the second one was shallow waters, which is in, also in progress, F uh, an additional five, five blocks. Well, the difference between one and the other is that in exploration, the, the geological information that the government has is not enough for companies to develop a, a, a production plan. So they have to start exploring the area and then designing their production plan. In the production, the information is sufficient so they, whoever wins the contract, they can go right ahead and produce. The, the third one, which will be land oil fields, and it will be only one. I have it there, the South North. That I was just told the other day, last week, uh, last Friday, actually that they are going to lump together the two south and north, and they will be putting for bid uh, 29 uh, lots in land. We'll have some, uh, most of them will be mature uh, fields, fields where PEMES already produced at some point, point, point of time, and some green field uh, land uh, fields, 29. And then will come deep waters in July, August, and then unconventional will be around September, October of this year, where the process will start. But as you see, once the process starts, it takes like how many months? Like eight months before we have a winner. So this is how the reform is, is going. If people in Mexico was preoccupied, of, well, everywhere, because of the prices of oil. And, but the reason why this uh, process has taken, is taking longer than was anticipated initially is not that much because of the price of oil, but because the amount of work that has to be done to create the new uh, contract, guidelines, regulations has been so huge that the institutional capacity just cannot go faster than that. And even they had to be very, they ha they, and they have been very, very open. You know, the first one they put a contract, then the con companies came and said, well, this is, this is not correct, or this is create this problem. They were very open to change all, all of that. So, but it's, it's, it's going fine. Well, as you can see, and for the amounts of oil that is available for private, the energy reforms creates huge opportunities, but also creates big, big challenge. So in Coahuila, we decided to create a non-profit organization. You know, Coahuila has 24% of national and conventional resources are located in Coahuila. It's a continuation of Eagle Four, part of it, and part of it is different. But you'll see, it's huge. And the issues that we have to deal with, as I mentioned before, some are things that you need to resolve somehow if you want the projects to, to, to be sustainable. And that has to be with the land right. That's the relation with the owners of the land, which is a little bit more complicated than in other countries. The relation with communities, water, and environment. I will get into some of this in detail, so I, I won't go any further. But also there are challenges that have to do with the efficiency. You need res human resources. In Coahuila and in general in Mexico, the, the, the private participation part of the uh, hydrocarbon or oil and gas industry is new. Because up to now it was only Pemex. So we, we lack the human resources in the, in the amounts that will be needed. But we also have a, a challenge of in, in technology and innovation of the, the efficiency of the supply chain is the logistic of the supply chain is crucial to the 
to the success of the projects and also the infrastructure. I think you here in Texas, to, where you have a you know better infrastructure and a more developed industry, you face that problems with the the, uh, the boom that you had in pre in previous years. So to cope with this, we decided to create a non-profit organization. This is in Coahuila, which is an alliance of universities, research centers, businesses, and local government. Right now, we have uh, this, the state government of Coahuila, 17 municipalities, which uh, is the zone where the, or the region where the, the reserves are, 15 companies and uh, business organizations, 11 higher education uh, institutions, and three research centers are part of the cluster. We were created last year in March. We were the idea for like uh, two years, so don't think, <laughs> but uh, formally we existed in March of last year. What is the purpose of this, of this cluster? The, it's very simple. We want to create this alliance to work, to create the conditions that will allow that the exploitation of uh, the res uh, oil reserves will generate a sustainable regional development with the greatest social benefits, and that that will be the base for Coahuila's uh, or the Northeast competitive advantage in this global war and this global industry, which is the oil and gas. <coughs> How do we work? We have six committees where we have to solve, create the conditions needed for achieving our mission. Human resources, infrastructure, supply chain, innovation and technology, environment, and land rights. I, I will refer to some of this as we go looking through the different uh, challenges that we are facing. And so I won't go into details unless in the Q&A session you ask for something related to this. Land rights. You know, in the <coughs> well, before going to that, in <coughs> Mexico has a, a system of property, of land property, which has two kinds of property, social property, the hido, and private property. And we don't have much experience in dealing with land rights. The only experience that we have is with other types of mining, you know, coal mining, and, and as time has passed, the, every time it's more contentious that, uh, because there was not a clear uh, regulation in the law. And uh, well, you need to solve this issue. In the, in the law, there was a, a huge advan advance in this, in this area. First, prior to this reform, the only obligation of some, uh, regarding Pemex or regarding the uh, uh, electrical projects was to pay for damages. But they didn't have to pay for anything else. But you know, this project, once they put something in your land, it will stay there for, I don't know, many, many years, generations, perhaps. So now you have to pay for damages, but now you have to pay rent. Let's say you are going to build a, a duct, or you are going to put a, a, some plant in, in your property. You have to pay rent for that. But also, you have to pay a, a percentage of the income that you're going to get from whatever is underneath that. Uh, and here is the process that, that is defined by the law, and how the negotiation has to be. First, the contract is awarded. Then the, the winner has to issue an interest, a letter of intent, saying what the project will be, and is desired to negotiate. Mm -hmm. Then the, the process has 180 days. Both parts have 180 days to reach an agreement. The, there is the possibility that uh, the, the owners can ask for a social witness 
to oversee the negotiation, not, not, not anything else, anything more. And after those 180 days, either you reach an agreement or you don't. If you do, then you go to the, in the case of social land, you go to the, the equivalent of a civil judge, this is an agrarian judge, and register your contract, which will be public. It's not something that you will hide. It will be public, anyone could watch it. And over there. If you don't reach an agreement, there are two things that can happen. You can ask for arbitration, or you can ask that a legal hydrocarbon land use permit be issued. In either, in either case, the law established a, a way to appraise the value of the land and set, establish certain guidelines for that. Then you have 30 days for the arbitration process. If you have an agreement, you go here. If you don't, then the authority will ask the judge to issue the land permit use. And there are rules. You have to pay something. But since you were not able to reach an agreement, the authority will decide how much. It has to be within the percentage that are set uh, by the law, this percentage. In the, case of, in the case of gas, you have to pay from 0.5% to 3% of a concept of net income that was explained in a little while. And in the, ca in the case of oil, you'll pay, you will pay from 0.5 to 2%. And the, the concept of income that is the basis for this calculation is gross income minus royalties minus whatever you pay to the state. After that, you apply the percentage that you reach uh, in within this range, and that's what you have to pay to the owner of the land. Okay. The problem with this is people is misinformed. We did a survey in the area of Coahuila, where we have the, uh, in Coahuila we will have eight blocks that will be put up uh, for bidding in when the unconventional uh, licitations start. And we did a survey, M most of them are ejidos, not, not most, all of them are ejidos. So we went to the, there and we did a survey. And 72% of them were not, aware of the legal requirements. You know, if you are going to sign a contract for 20, 30 years, well, you have to have your, uh, your personality well established. You have to, if you are a, a owner, you have to have your deed. If you are a, a social, you have to have all the legal uh, requirements uh, that establish that you are the legal owner of that piece of land. So. The, the, the point was that most of them have no, uh, have their papers not finished. For example, in a private business, you have a, a board of directors. Well, you have to, to register the board of directors before the certain registry authority. In the social uh, land, you do the same before an agrarian authority. But, and, and those things have to do with how you elect the, your board of directors. And the Ejidos usually do it. They have to elect the board every three years. There is an assembly, they vote, and they elect a new, a new, or ratify the old one. But then you have to go and register. But they don't do that part. So in some cases, they, they have been like 15 years <laughs> that they've been electing. And they do it properly, but they just forget to, that they have to, 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 to register. You know, 46% lack their former titles. So that's something we have to solve before the, the contracts start being awarded. And there are high expectations and concern. The expectations is that they'll get the better paid jobs and opportunities for business. But there is also a great uh, concern about water availability and contamination. What we are doing as Cluster, we are holding a 
big effort to di disseminate information. We go to these places and have training meetings, seminars for landowners, cartographic mi mapping. Also, we are creating, this is very interesting, maybe we could some work in something with you in the future. We are, we're working on a guide, well, on a guide for land use contract. You know, there are many, many alternatives that can happen to have something that you can tell the, the, the owner, which usually will have no legal background or experience. If this is the case, this is the thing that you can do, you know? Applying the law and, uh, and, and international experience. And we're working on that. We're almost halfway through. <laughs> and we're also uh, working on negotiation assessment. Mm -hmm. Community relations social line. This is a very important thing in the, you know, in the AMP activities will take place in small communities. There you have the name of the towns and the population. You know, 1.9 thousand people, 10,000. The, the largest, I think, what is 20,000. 20, so, as it was the case here too in, in Eagle Four Shell, you know, Carrizo Spring had like 2,000 people before the the boom, and they went from two or three thousand to almost twelve thousand, with all the problems that that bring. So, and also there is a very weak presence of federal agencies that are the responsible for solving many of the things. And the law mandates that a percentage be given from operators to community for human development. And here the problem will be how you set the priorities and how you manage the resources. And this is very important for a concept that is very important for the success of this contract, which we call it, uh, and is called in the literature, social lines, license. In countries where they have a very solid and very strong judicial legal framework, usually you don't need this because when you have an issue, you go to a court and you solve it. In countries like Mexico and many others around the world with uh, weak legal systems, you have to take into account the community. Because if you don't, they'll be stopping your operation, which is very, very expensive. So you have to work a long and lasting relation like if you were going to get married to someone. Because you are going to be married to that com uh, community for 20, 30 years, you know, which is usually longer than marriage is last, you know? <laughs> so w we have to work that. And we're experts on, on that, by the way. Water, and this is something you know much more than I do. I'm not an expert on water, but I am worried. <laughs> well, here the challenge is some were previous to the reform. We cannot put the blame on the reform because they already existed, which is the, the, the imbalance that we have in the Rio Bravo. And, and the new one is uh, the water that will be needed for the new activities and how to manage and dispose of the fracking water or have to substitute it, if, if uh, that was the case. <coughs> Here's the chronic uh, deficit. The main lesson from this is that we have a deficit, was very huge in 2013. When the rain is above average in Mexico, we are not that bad, we almost reached, you know, balance, but that's not always the case. When it's average, we have a deficit. So last year, the, uh, you see the deficit in, uh, this is the drought conditions, it was very, 70% of drought in the, in, the ba in the Rio Bravo Basin compared to less than 40% in, in the national. In, in 2014 is not that bad, and now it's much better because last year it rained a lot, and it's still raining like here. So this is a problem. And also you have the demands for the new needs. We calculated what were the demands depending on the, how many wells you were drilling per year. And we created three scenarios. One low, mid, and high with 200 wells per year, 320 and 500. This 
for us it's a lot. For you it's nothing because here in Eagle Force Shell you were drilling 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. You know, it was a something very, I don't know this year, I, don't, I think you'll be more like this. And uh, so the requirement for that is, uh, you know, in the worst case or the best case, depending on which point you are looking at, is uh, 8.5, I don't know the unit, I think it's millions, no, billions of uh, mm of uh, cubic meters of water, okay? So we went and see what was the availability of groundwater. And we took the basins of Burgos and Peyotes, which is the one relevant for Coahuila, and for the, the, where this activity will be taking place. And we calculated, well, we didn't calculate, we searched for the rights that are outstanding the water that is available, and in each one, that uh, rights that have not been assigned to anyone. So, as you see, we have enough water, ground water, for the new activities, apparently. Because here are the aquifers in that, in that zone. I won't go through all of them. But here's, you have 37.4 millions of uh, cubic meters of water. And in the high scenario, you will need only 8.5. So no problem. <coughs> Be ready. Rest. <laughs> but the, the summing up this, this issue is we, what are the men could for oil and gas could be met by ground sources. But the problem will be the treatment and the disposal of water, which is a return water, which is a problem there, and I think you have a problem here. And Rio uh, the Rio Bravo, Bravo balance, which in above average, real average rain years, we hardly need them, may worsen because that calculation that I presented, it only takes into account the water that will be needed for fracking. But it would, doesn't take into account population growth and other activities, industrial activities growth, which will, you know, the population growth of the region, if that happens, will be huge. You know, for example, the, the 17 counties, the, the population council, which is uh, responsible for projection population in Mexico, had an estimation that the <coughs> those counties will grow in the next 15 years 1% per year prior to the energy reform. After the reform with the, in the high scenario, that growth will go from 1% to almost 4%. So that's a lot of people. And even in the, in, the, in the lower scenario, it will go to <coughs> uh, 3%. So that's lots of people, and that's lots of water, and that's lots of everything that we need. So that's a problem. This is a, an estimation of the gap that we'll have in the Rio Gra Bravo or Rio Grande. We call it Bravo, you call it Grande. It's Bravo Grande or Bravo <laughs> Grande Bravo. <laughs> and uh, so the, the existing. Uh, Sustainable water supply is like this, 7.9. The demand will be this. You have a shortage of 33% in 15 years more. So that's, that's, a, that's a huge concern. That's something we have to start working. Well, we have started working. No? It's not like <laughs> we're not worried about this. And well, <coughs> there is here, I, I wanted to give you the, the idea that ha the authorities are working to solve this and, and the amount of money that will be needed. In agriculture, it's where you have the most contribution to solve the problem, you have like 70%. And what you have to do mainly will be to increase the efficiency in the use of water for agriculture. 
in, 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 Cuban, in Cuban public also you have an important contribution, 10% of the problem. And there the leakage reduction, which is huge in Mexico. And also industrial. And you have to look at the supply side, you know, to look at infrastructure, see how much water, surface water you can get from other sources, groundwater, and other activities. And then you could solve the, the, the gap in and it doesn't cost that much. It's 58 billions of our billions, which will be, what, trillions here? 58 trillions. A billion for us is a million of a million. And here is billion is a thousand millions, correct? A billion is a thousand million. Is that correct? Well, Mexico is a million of a million. 12 zeros and nine zeros is the difference. Okay, so, well, and the other thing that is very important, especially for Mexico, is to look at the international experience on, because we have to do something about the management of water. It, our system is quite inefficient. Australia, I've been looking into that and I saw the, the the talk you had last year, which is, I, I found it very, very good. And uh, well, they, they, they have been very creative in developing a market for, for water and the, the steps that they, how they designed the, 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 the market as a consequence of a drought in, in Australia is very, very uh, enlightening. You know, you have the market research and the, you, you start the negotiation and then you do the actual uh, trades and finalize the trade. And something like this we have to, to, to develop in, in, in Mexico. In Mexico, water resources are owned by the government, or by the nation, but administered by the, by the, by the government, and it's very inefficient. It uh, has improved over the last years, but it still is, 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 is inefficient. What is already going on? Well, we have created water banks, and we have a new general water law, which aims to deal with many of these issues, but is still pending discussion in Congress. There was a lot of uh, uh, discussion. In Mexico, the, 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 pro the, the issue of privatization is very, very touchy. And even though what the law doesn't, act, doesn't propose to privatize the law, because it doesn't change who owns the water, but it changes how you uh, manage the water, like in oil. You didn't change the, the property of the oil. You change how you, the market works. And it's the same that you're trying to do with the water. But we have elections in uh, Congress elections this coming July, I mean June. So it's all in the Congress. So I hope with the new Congress we'll be able to push this forward. What is the the, loss in the water banks, well, it's a mechanism for to give information and advice to, to promote the market for water rights, you know. And uh, there are lots of needs. You have to, to empower this, uh, this water bank with the capacity, operative capacity, computing capacity, so that they are able to regulate the supply and demand and establish an efficient market for water. And the law. Well, the, the main themes of the law is to improve coordination between levels of authority. In Mexico, the, the water is federal, but state and local government have some uh, responsibilities. But right now, it's a lot of gray areas where it's not clear who is responsible for what. So what the law tries to do is to uh, you know, introduce precision into those responsibilities so that every level of government knows what to do. Then there is in the Constitution, the water for human consumption is a, a human right. So, but they make it a, they give it a, a content for that, a 50 daily liters per person. Also, the, the law tries to strengthen uh, social and private uh, participation in, in the different mechanisms and councils. 
And this, this point, the FARC, is, is a crucial part where they establish a new concession regime for the protection of water resources and prevent hoarding. And this is where it stopped. <laughs> you know, say, ah, you are privatizing the law, the water. And so it has to wait. And establish a new system for, for tariffs, more rational one, and opens information. Everybody will have the inform has to have the information regarding water resources, infrastructure, services, quality, quantity, et cetera. And creates a regulatory body at the state level, which didn't exist. So the states usually take off their hands and let the problem just roll on. And defines the, the sanctions for all different types of uh, problems. Well, now, just to finish my presentation, I will refer to one issue regarding human resources. This has to, de to do more with the efficiency in which the reform may, or the operations can take place. In Coahuila, the current coverage is insufficient. And, th and the case is the same for Mexico. You know, in high school, 67% of the people that are supposed to be in, in that grade or level are. And in higher education, 37%. So without the reform, we had a problem. With the reform, the problem is much, much bigger. And we have to train professional technicians, workers, to fill the, the needs of the new industry. We have what type uh, of people we need from Pemex and international experience, young workers, scientists, professionals. And but here's, here's a, to give you an idea of the magnitude of the challenge. Right now, we are producing 3,000. This is referred to the state of Coahuila. But the problem is very similar in Mexico. We're producing 3,000 uh, medium and high, high education graduates per year. But we will be needing 12,000. That means four times what we're doing now. So that's a lot of work to do to create infrastructure, to train the teachers, to do whatever you need to do. The, design new ways of virtual, digital, or whatever is needed to be able to, to meet this challenge in, over the next 15 years. We created a program, which is a very good one. It's, it's been used as an example in Mexico. It will cost us 50 million US uh, dollar per year in Coahuila. And here is an opportunity that we may work with this university. As a matter of fact, actually, we are already working with TAMU, which is part of your a and system. And that's our offices in Mexico. And thank you very much. And any question that you may have, I'm <laughs> glad to. No, I, I don't see any problem in meeting the, 20, the 25 percentage. Actually, now, if before the reform, the, the local content or most content was, was beyond that. So I don't, I don't see a problem in meeting that. Uh, because the way they define the, the local content includes uh, labor, includes uh, m many things. So I don't see a problem, not even in, in, uh, in, in I don't know if they, are, they will reduce it for shallow, I mean, for deep water contracts, but I think we can do it. The, the, I, I think Mexico has enough industry for that. Actually, people thought it should be higher than that. But I think it's a reasonable one to, to start. I don't, I, I don't think there, there should be any problem. Why? Well, the thing is that uh, 
the, there were real issues. You know, Pemex was being, uh, was suffering a, a, a huge deterioration process, mainly due to the fact that a, the, the Treasury Department was taking all the surplus from Pemex to finance public expenditure. And uh, they tried to do a, well, that's another issue. I would. And so Pemex was not able to do enough investment. Mm -hmm. uh, proven reserves were falling down. Production was falling down. And uh, so the, there was a need to, to, to do a change because we do have resources, but we were not exploiting them in a very rational way. And uh, <coughs> there was also the, the issue of corruption. And so they said, well, if, if you need to, to, to take care of corruption, you need competition. No. But mainly it was because the, the, the model that we had was, was not longer sustainable. And there was a, it took us like 25 years, you know, because we've been <laughs> discussing this, uh, this reform from, you know, I, wa I was in the federal government from uh, 1976 to 19, 88, and we started discussing that at the time, and then I went into, I was uh, uh, representative and senator, and we <laughs> kept on working, and then I was governor, and we kept on working, and then, then when I was uh, director of Pemex, and I, we kept working on that, and, and after that, many, many, many changes. It, it was absurd, you know. There is no way a company can, uh, survive if you take 60 or 65 percent of the gross income as taxes. This is just impossible. So it took some time for Hacienda to realize that, but finally they said. And then there was the political circumstance that uh, usually the, the PAN PAN uh, party was a, uh, for the reform. The PRI was not so much uh, for the reform. But this president, this, uh, since he was candidate, he says he was for the reform. So it was very clear that he was going to win. And as soon as he won, you had enough votes to, to carry on the reform. But there was a need and a growing conscious of, of that need. Well, the, the first thing, uh, corruption is, in my view, is not so much a matter of, of personalities or people, you know. Uh, corruption is, uh, is, is has to do more with the institutional framework, with the rules of uh, proceedings and, and that. And what, uh, let me go. To the reform. What they, what they did is several things. First, what I already mentioned of this uh, National Hydrocarbon Commission, which is a technical body, independent from uh, political uh, 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 yeah, intentions. You know, people there are uh, technicians. They don't have political careers. And the way they are appointed and the period that they should serve uh, will go beyond the responsibility of a, of a president. But also there is another, another uh, everything is public. You want to see anything of what is going on in this bidding process, you get into your computer and you see. So the contracts will have to be made public. There are too many eyes looking into this. And I think that's the only way to, you know, to have you know people from having bad uh, bad thoughts. Mm -hmm. They you strengthen the, this uh, the CNA the way they appointed the the new well. Also, there is a new law which already has been approved and is now in the process of being approved by by Congress by state Congress, an anti-corruption law that will de design a much better uh, uh, institutional framework for. Uh, fighting corruption in Mexico. 
because now everything was, uh, in, uh, you know, the, the, the authority responsible for overseeing was appointed by the president, by the governors, and by the mayors. And they were supposed to oversee the mayor, the governor, or the president that appointed them. Now, that has changed. You see, and they were also responsible for investigating, for prosecuting, and for sentencing. You as lawyer know that those functions should be in separate bodies, shouldn't they? And now we are, we are doing that. You have a, the, the part of the auditing, part of the investigation, the part of the sentencing, and the prosecution in different, uh, and the, the way of appointing those people will now be independent of the body that will be uh, uh, overseen. Plus, the, 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 the obligation to make everything public. We're making the system more and more transparent it's not an easy process because there, as you can imagine, there are many resistances, but it's happening, and we're going that way. Well, there will be different uh, parts of the responsibility. Uh, when the, when the, 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 in the bidding process, you will have to tell the National Hydrocarbon Commission where you are going to get the water. Then you have to go and require the, the permission from the, which will be the federal government. But then you have to develop the. So the private companies are going to develop yeah. the water. Resource. Yeah. Yeah, and the ASEA, the Oversea uh, Environmental Body, will oversee that uh, you are doing the things properly. No, they pay royalties to government and to landowners like, uh, like they do here. That's no different. And they pay taxes. What the law did is in Mexico, we didn't have a clear market for that, nor a clear uh, legislation to what, what is the right of, uh, of the landowner. Here is different because the landowner owns usually the, the mineral rights. But in Mexico, the mineral rights are owned by the government. So the landowner didn't own anything, but they suffer the, the, all the problems of having someone in your land and living there for three years. So what the law did was, well, you have the right for this. And they gave them some rights and established the procedures to, to, to make those rights uh, go into a contract form. So the, 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 the producer will pay royalties to the, to, the, to the government, which have to be competitive. They will not pay the royalties that Pemex is paying. Pemex has no alternative because the boss is saying you have to pay this. You know, the owner of Pemex will tell him. Actually, Pemex will go in a, in the, in the end, Pemex will converge to the royalties that will be paid by private. But private will start paying, you know, the, the going rate in the, in, the, in the industry internationally. They will pay some uh, 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 rights, I mean, so some percentage of royalties to landowners, like they do here, and income tax like any other company. No, they don't have any, any other, uh, uh, but all after that, everything is yours.
Well, we, well, we produce 2.5 million barrels per day in Texas alone produces more than that. Uh, Pemex has good technology. We don't have good, uh, you know, the, in the supply chain, we don't have enough businesses who know the trade. Because uh, up to now, the only way to be in the, in the supply chain was to sell to Pemex. And to sell to Pemex was very complicated, as you can imagine. And not everyone had the money or the the cost to do it. So now there will be many other alternatives to Pemex. You don't have to work with Pemex if you don't want to. But that has to happen. That's why we have, in the, uh, if you remember, in the committees, we have a, a supply chain committee, which we're trying to develop you know, uh, businesses to become providers for. Actually, now we're working with uh, one large big company. To They want to. They want the cluster to help them uh, identify the potential suppliers, and they will take them, you know, and train them to and certify them as suppliers once they go through all that pro certifying process. Is there a yeah, because since this this activity was limited, mm. and for example, in Coahuila, we we have I don't know less than a hundred mm -hmm. wells now. So the universities in Coahuila do, were not producing engineers or technicians that know the trade. So we have to re reconvert. And that's a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. What's fine? What's the reform on the exploration production side? Yeah. What about the planning market? It's open. It's to totally open to private investors. All you have to do is you go present your project to the uh, to the other uh, regulatory agency, the Energy Commission, the Energy Regulatory Commission, CRE, and you present your project and they'll give you a permit. Well, there, there are traders. There are traders. You can sell it to Pemex. You can sell it to a private uh, uh, contractor that uh, that trades on oil and gas. Well, but I guess is that what's contemplated, or, or is it yeah, it's contemplated. Yeah. Yeah. Most of that infrastructure can be made by uh, carried out by private. The government now is uh, developing a huge infrastructure of ducts, but that's for CFA and Pemex, and some for supplying gas to some parts of the country that uh, don't, do not have gas now. But as private, you can you can build it. Uh, actually, now there is a company that is working in Mexico, on the border of the Rio Bravo Grande, and uh, near Hidalgo, Coahuila. And they are producing gas for Pemex. They were contracted by, for, by Pemex. They get paid for getting the gas out. Then they buy the, the gas from Pemex. They built a duct through the Rio Grande, and they are putting it into their network here and sell it here in the United States. So you can do that. And you can put refineries, uh, uh, storage, Tanks, uh, distribution docks, or gas stations. In in each case, there is a schedule. For example, the, the, the in, in the case of gasoline, the, the, the and it's already been published. Uh, for example, last year, the price of gasoline was set by uh, the Treasury Department. Every month they will change the price. This year they only changed it once in January, 
Now everybody's complaining because the price of gas in Mexico is very high compared to the, to the one here in the United States because of the, the price didn't reflect that. No, 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 wait. This is the process of change. The next year, they will establish a range, and the year after, it will be free. You have to do it because you are moving from one situation in the West, one, only one company, and you need the, 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 uh, the infrastructure for markets to work, to, to be built. You, know, you need more actors to participate in the, in the market, and so on. So that takes time. You cannot do it. We learn from the problems that, and the mistakes that we made with the telephone privatization. You know, we went from a public monopoly to a private one, uh, which is even worse because with the public ones, you at least you can rule them, but with the private, there's no way. Yes, there, there are some. Well, not, not very precise, though, I, I must admit. Because uh, I think the, the reform didn't <laughs> look at Texas problems, <laughs> look at our problems. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, you have something that you, you can work with uh, on that. Because there is the, the limit that we, we know we have. We have an international co commitment, and then we have the the right assignment mechanism in place, so you have to, and, and the, new, uh, the new activity has, has to look into the viability of the, uh, the projects as water is concerned. So even though it's not uh, clearly stated, it's, uh, it's not all, it won't just happen anything getting all the water they want. Actually, no, they won't. They won't recognize the government. But uh, from a few years back, in this region, <coughs> the, 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 the what was a problem became a, an asset, because everybody was drilling for water without permit or without anything. So they say, well, those people who do not have <laughs> a, a lawful right cannot longer drill or pump water. So many people who were producing something with that illegal water, now they cannot do it. And that has been a huge problem, but the government has stood uh, firm, and they have all that water available. And I think they did it for that reason, you know, to lower the rights and to put a, a lower <coughs> limit, a boundary, a boundary, yeah, you know, in preparation for the for the reform. That just seems like a huge opportunity to provide <coughs> new regulations Yeah. Yeah, but I'll take that into consideration because we constantly are, uh, you know, doing some papers and submitting to the regulators with our opinions. Sometimes they pay attention, sometimes they don't. <laughs> but we keep and the system. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. I want to thank Dr. Montemayor for uh, uh, participating in this program and just have a token of our appreciation oh, thank from you the university. Very. And thank you all for being here. For